Greetings, friends, and welcome to the podcast of Jewish Ideas, a Torah in Motion podcast. In the year 1204, the great Jewish thinker Maimonides, also known as Rambam, passed away in Egypt. Maimonides' works were so immensely influential that the subsequent decades and centuries of Jewish intellectual activity can, at least to a large degree, be understood as a series of responses to Maimonides' work. Some adapted and expanded Maimonides' ideas, whereas others furiously rejected them, throwing open new horizons in the history of Jewish thought. Today, we will take a tour of Jewish philosophy in the centuries following Maimonides and explore some elements of this contested intellectual legacy. With us to discuss these topics today is Tamar Rudavsky, professor of philosophy at The Ohio State University. An eminent authority on the subject of medieval Jewish philosophy, she has written, edited, and co-edited several books in this field. Her most recent book, Jewish Philosophy in the Middle Ages, published by Oxford University Press in 2018, is to my mind still the finest overview and introduction to the topic of medieval Jewish philosophy and highly recommended. It is a pleasure to welcome Professor Rudavsky to the podcast of Jewish Ideas today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, so there is, within the history of Jewish thought, it seems to me at any rate, um, a divide between b- before Maimonides and, and after Maimonides. Uh, in other words, that Maimonides' life and thought represents a sort of defining milestone uh, within this history. Uh, and I first want to ask, uh, begin by asking, why was this the case? What was it about Maimonides? What was it about his writings that made him such an immense presence? Um, what, what, how can we account for that? Well, I think we have to put Maimonides into a historical context. He was obviously the chief rabbi of the North African community. He was also so a doctor. He worked with the, um, the, the Islamic court and was renowned as a rabbinic scholar, communicated with rabbis all around the Mediterranean. We have letters that he, you know, that he wrote to people in Provence, southern France. So as a rabbinic scholar, of course, the writer of the Mishnah Torah, which to this day is a compendium and used in the Orthodox communities, he was the first to compile a complete summary of halakha, of Jewish law. But in the area of philosophy, he was also the first medieval Jewish philosopher to take seriously the challenges of Greek and Islamic philosophy. We have people prior to him. We have, for example, uh, Yehuda Levi. We've got Saad Gaon. We've got uh, Ibn Daud, who are familiar with pieces of the philosophical world. But Maimonides is much more comprehensive. We have, in fact, a letter that he wrote to Uh, one of his translators, I don't even have time to read the works of Aristotle and of Verowees. He's trying desperately to keep on top of the the recent philosophy. And I think the fact that he tried so hard to incorporate the philosophy, the science of his age with halakha really provided just a new world order, a new way of thinking about how to position Judaism in the context of the wider world. And what's interesting, I mean, scholars, you know, Maimonides scholars look at both. We read both the rabbinic and the philosophical, and there are divergences between the two. There are occasional contradictions between the two. But I think there's a sense in which Maimonides was systematic in a way that no previous Jewish philosopher was. And so what we have is a, a complete ontology, a metaphysics, an epistemology, a way of life, a way of living that no previous Jewish philosopher had offered us. Right. So, so that that sums up the achievement of Maimonides. Uh, but of course, with uh, with this great achievement came great controversy. And both during Maimonides' lifetime, but also uh, you know in the decades following, there were great controversies throughout Europe, especially in southern France, um, often known as the Maimonides controversy or something. Uh, especially in the year twelve thirty two, that was one um, sort of important uh, important high point of that. Um, so the question is, well, what was the nature of these controversies? What which specific ideas or methods? Uh, what what is it about Maimonides' writings which other rabbinic and, and intellectual authorities within the Jewish people couldn't abide. Right. Uh, the whole period, actually starting during Maimonides' own lifetime and subsequ- you know, after his death, continuing, the whole period is known as the period of the Maimonidean controversies. And I think they centered around a number of things. There were two main controversies. There's one that uh, that started with the Gaon of Baghdad already 
arguing that Maimonides is encroaching on rabbinic authority. You know, we see the Mishnah Torah as an incredible achievement, but imagine you're a Rav in this period, and all of a sudden a book appears that basically puts you out of business. We don't need you rabbis anymore. All we have to do is turn to the pages in the Mishnah Torah. And the rabbinical authorities were um, were quite sensitive to that. And so um, they felt that Maimonides has intruded upon their territory, just eliminating them from the conversation. So that was, you know, one round of controversy. But I think there were also deeper issues as well. Uh, in Provence, as you mentioned, there was a ban on reading Maimonides. There was then a counter ban by his supporters. The Christian church came into play and burnt some of the books. I mean, there was really a, a, quite a um, number of events. And I think they centered around a number of problematic issues in Rambam's writings. I think they are serious issues. One, he was said to deny the doctrine of resurrection which was an important platform of Jewish belief. And in fact, Maimonides himself was very sensitive to that charge and wrote a treatise on resurrection right, to respond to the claim that he denied resurrection. I personally think he didn't do a very good job responding to that, and other scholars have, you know, have uh, chimed in as well. But that was a serious concern. Another concern was his denial of anthropomorphic readings of God in the Bible. There are many passages in scripture that describe God in human terms. And Maimonides worked very hard to remove any anthropomorphic element from our understanding of the deity. He introduced a whole doctrine of negative theology, negative predication, claiming that one can say nothing positive about God. And that, again, was also very threatening and so became a controversial issue. He also, and, and some of his followers, we may talk about some of the have his followers, um, he is said to have denied the efficacy of prophecy and miracles. And there are passages in both the guide and Mishnah Torah which do question whether or not mirac uh, miracles are supernatural events or whether they are part of the natural order. So that's a problem. And the final problem, or the final issue, if you will, is his um, introduction of what's come to be known as ta'amea mitzvot, the rationality of the commandments. Now we can already see Sadya Gaon centuries earlier introducing the idea that the commandments, the mitzvot, have a rational component. But Maimonides made that a major platform in the latter chapters of the guide and gave rise to a number of disputations over whether or not we can introduce rationality or reason into our understanding of the 613 commandments. So there were any number of issues that might have driven his, his opponents wild, but you take all of them and you can see why. Um, the condemnations were so powerful. So you might say there's quite enough to be getting along with. There's quite enough, yes, right. yes. <laughs> okay, fair, fair enough. Um, let's, uh, let me ask you the following. I mean, there are some who have said that, uh, because the the century following Maimonides, a uh, century and a half rather, was the, uh, witnessed the rise of Kabbalah, specifically in Spain, mm -hmm. uh, but also in Italy and elsewhere. Um, and there is, there is a, an academic theory in which essentially... Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism of the medieval strain that we know of, um, that arose during that time, was was part of this reaction against Maimonides, was part of this um, sort of uh, countermeasure um, to try and shore up beliefs. Do you, do you give this credence? Do you think this is a, a satisfactory uh, reading of this? You know, was, was a reaction to Maimonides su sufficiently severe that it would also, you know, give rise to these kind of mystical ideas, which then took off on a life of their own in, in, in subsequent centuries? Right. I just came out of a class which was talking about the, the difference between causation and correlation. Right. And I think we can argue that there are correlated events, but not necessarily a causal connection between them. Maimonides is writing during a period of tremendous upheaval. He's, you know, we're, we're watching the move from a Spanish Islamic empire to a Christian empire. We're seeing Christian influences and Kabbalah certainly has that, that influence from the Christian world as much as anything. 
Maimonides also represents, and we might talk about this later on, a hyperintellectualism, a, a, an extremely rational approach to Judaism, whereas Kabbalah is much less rational in its approach and is taking a much more emotional or passionate response to, to uh, Judaic doctrines. And so, yes, there's always a pendulum. You know, he, you've got a figure who was so rational, who was so steep in logic, so steeped in science. I mean, I think of it very much. I mean, my recent book really talks about the tension between science and Judaism between the rational world, you know, Athens and Jerusalem, we've heard that trope many, many times, but there's a truth here that there's a, a rational component, there's an emotional, uh, fideistic component, and Kabbalah represents that fideistic component that many felt was absent in this hyper-intellectual atmosphere. There's actually a sub-question to that, because you mentioned that it wasn't just Maimonides' specific ideas, but his approach. And it seems to me possible, and you know, please feel free to weigh in, that part of the objection to Maimonides was not just his um, hyper-intellectualized approach, but the the consequent idea that of the aristocratic approach. In other words, that true understanding, true um, salvation, if you like, was only available to the select few, namely the philosophers. That yes. uh, and and that was it. Uh, do you do you think that, or to what extent did that contribute to the animosity against Maimonides' and ideas? Oh. Oh, it absolutely contributed. Think of Plato. Plato is the first elitist telling us that only the philosopher kings have the wisdom. Now, Maimonides has read Farabi, who is a Platonist. So he's incorporated al-Farabi, an Islamic philosopher, into his own political thinking. And he's of the view, I, I think, just reading, anyone who reads just the introduction to the guide, where Maimonides basically dismisses you know, the Amha'aretz. He says, look, if you're Amha'aretz, if you don't understand what I'm doing here, put the book down and pretend you've never seen it. That is one of the most elitist statements in the medieval world. I mean, very much Averroes made a similar point in his treatise on religion and philosophy. And so, yes, he is to some extent elitist. At the very end of the guide, he's talking about human perfection and who there's a very famous parable and um Part three, book 51, where he's talking about who actually has access to the king, to God. And he describes the rabbis that are circling around the outward perimeter. They don't even make it into the courtyard. And those who have studied metaphysics and physics are in the courtyard. In incredibly elitist and incredibly off-putting to someone who doesn't have that training. I mean, I see we see the same thing in contemporary society as well, just to make a, a political statement. There's always this tension between the hyper-elitism on the one hand and the common person who doesn't have access. Kabbalah provides you with that access without having to undergo all the intellectual training that someone like Maimonides requires. Yes, and I suppose that rabbis who whose job it was to watch over the, 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 so to speak, their flock, you know, their community to try and, um, you know, safeguard their spiritual health, as it were, they would not have been too friendly to Maimonides' um, elitism on that score. Um, before we move on to the specifics of the counter Maimonidean uh, way, perhaps uh, I, I could ask about those who supported Maimonides in the century or two after his death. I mean, could we say that there was a Maimonidean school after his death? Which Which thinkers would be considered within that, and, and to what extent were Maimonides' ideas defended uh, in the period after his death? Right, and I, I was actually thinking about that. There really isn't a Maimonidean school. I mean, what we have are, you know, following Maimonides, what we have are a number of commentaries on the guide. So we have, for example, a Ramban, Nachmanides, Rav Moshe ben Nachman, who writes an elaborate commentary on the guide. But, you know, he disagrees with Maimonides on many points. But I think to some extent we can think of him as a follower. I mean, to the extent that he's actually taking the time to comment. Abravanel enters into a huge controversy with uh, Albo over the 13 Articles of Faith, when, you know, that are outlined in the Yigdal that we all know. And Abravanel, again, he disagrees with Maimonides articulation of those 13 articles, but he's primarily in the Maimonidean camp. So we find individuals who are in the camp. I want to just suggest, if you jump to the 20th century, look at someone like Soloveitchik, the Rav, is a Maimonidean. 
He's engaged in exactly the same struggle. I mean, and you'll probably have podcasts down the road, so I won't steal your thunder. <laughs> right, yes. okay. But he's a Maimonidean. Someone I think you studied with, Menachem Kellner at Shalem. Yes, is a Maimonidean. In fact, he has a book that just came out, um, the a Maimonidean view of the other. I haven't read it yet. I have to get a hold of it. But he's a Maimonidean. So Maimonideanism has not disappeared. It's, but you have to sometimes look hard to find it. Sure, and, and I would say, I mean, certainly with Soloveitchik and certainly with my old uh, professor and mentor, Menachem Kellner, who we'll have on here at some point, um, mm -hmm. it, it is true to say that to a certain degree they are Maimonidean, but it's also true to say that they have very specific takes on Maimonides. Oh, sure. Everyone has, you know, David Hartman, everyone has a specific take. So in, to some extent, you look at the contemporary world, they're all Maimonideans. I mean, it's hard to do philosophy without taking him in stride. Right. Which is really the question that I began this conversation with. I mean, it's still astonishing that eight centuries after Maimonides' death, everyone tries to make themselves out to be a Maimonidean. Um, right. I mean, think of you know, the, you know, the old adage: everything after Plato is but a footnote to Plato. All philosophy is a footnote to Plato. All philosophy post Maimonides is a wrestling with. Take someone like Spinoza in the uh, theological political treatise. You may have Steve Nadler here to talk about that. Um, Spinoza struggles mightily with Maimonides in that treatise. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, so th that was the the um, with regards to supporters of Maimonides. Um, and now let's talk a little bit about the counter reaction, which there was quite considerable. Um, the the main thinker or the, the prominent thing that I wish to, to focus on for the time being uh, was a man called Chastai Kreskas. Um, so could you perhaps give us a short uh, introduction? He is somewhat well known to those who follow, who, who you know, have read up on uh, Jewish intellectual history, but uh, I believe insufficiently so. Um, so could you perhaps give us a little bit on, on where he lived, his works, his life, um, and his his general philosophical uh, outlook? Right. Okay. So Crescas is writing, he's born in 1340, dies in 1410 in Barcelona, and his best known student is Josef Albo. Actually, I mean, we don't usually define a someone by their students, but in this case, Alpo was his um, interpreter, so to speak. And he became the spiritual head of Spanish Jews in much the same way that Maimonides was for the North African Jewish community. He was, But he was working in a Christian environment. And so he's involved with um, Christian disputations, with denials of Judaism. He writes several treatises supporting Judaism against Christianity. For our purposes, probably his most important work is Or Hashem, Or Adonai, which was recently uh, came out in a wonderful edition by Ross Weiss. It's um, uh, the first English critical edition of Crescas's work. And so anyone who wants to read up on Crescas should get a hold of that. She's got a wonderful introduction. And he's one, as you put it, he's one of his uh, most severe critics among the Jewish philosopher. He... And I do want to mention a second philosopher, Gersonides, Raoul Bag, who is writing in southern France, in Provence, uh, slightly before Crescas, also takes issue with Maimonides, but not nearly as severely as does Crescas in Or Hashem. Or uh, Crescas really works chapter by chapter, laying out Maimonides and then refuting him. So it's a very interesting and important rebuttal. Interesting. As far as I can tell, I mean, um, much of Crescas's critique focuses on a critique of Aristotle, um, which, of course, Maimonides based a lot of his philosophy, mm -hmm. at least on a neo-Aristotelian, a medieval form of Aristotle as refracted through the lens of, of Islamic philosophy. Um, and, and I want to ask, I mean, firstly, two things. Firstly, what was the nature or the major elements of, of Crescas's critique? But also, was this common? Was it common for the anti-Maimonidean crowd to focus their ire on the Aristotelian roots or basis of Maimonides' philosophy? Yes. In his work, he lays out a complete summary of Aristotelian metaphysics and ontology. In fact, Wolfson's book, Has Dikreskas, goes through in enormous detail, much greater detail than anyone would ever want in this century. Um, all the references taken straight from Aristotle. And he does that in order to link Maimonides to the bad guy. Now, 
To what extent did he understand Aristotle? I would say very, very well. He knew his philosophy. And I want to bring in an analog here from the Islamic philosophical world. I was thinking about this the other day. There's a, there's a moment in Islamic philosophy that it, it's an exchange between the philosopher Al-Ghazali and Ibn Rushd of Veroes. Al-Ghazali is a fideist. He's much like Crescas. In fact, I've been working on a paper uh, comparing some of the features of Ghazali and Crescas. It's really very interesting, the um, overlap. Could you perhaps define fideism for those uh, in our audience who aren't familiar? Ah, fideism is, is, is simply the view that belief is not rooted in reason, not necessarily rooted in reason. I think of Tertullian statement, Tertullian, a a Christian father at the beginning of the millennium, who basically is known for the statement, credo quia absurdum est, I believe because it is absurd. I believe despite the absurdity, or I embrace the absurdity. That's, you know, a characteristic of fideism. So Ghazali is a fideist in that sense. Averroes is a staunch Aristotelian. He's completely rooted in Aristotle. Ghazali felt that Aristotle threatened Islamic belief. And so he wrote a work entitled Tahafut al Falasifa, The Incoherence of Philosophy, in which he detailed in excruciating detail all those aspects of philosophy that he found obnoxious, many of them taken straight from Aristotle. And then in response, Ibn Rushd of Aroes wrote Al-Tahafut Al-Tahafut, the incoherence of the incoherence in which he responded and rebutted Ghazali page by page, chapter by chapter. And so we find something similar going on here with Crescas and Aristotle. He says, Basically, in order to fight the enemy, you have to know the enemy. And so he lays out in tremendous detail the Aristotelian slash Maimonidean system and then goes for the jugular. And so, yes, it's, it, it's um, surprisingly accurate and rooted in text. Yes. Interesting. Interesting you brought up uh, Al-Ghazali, the, the Islamic philosopher, because uh, to, to my mind, there is it's an interesting facet, both of Islamic and, and Jewish philosophy, that you have occasional figures like Al-Ghazali and, and Yudha Levi who are very philosophically literate and yet use their skill precisely to undermine philosophy yeah. as such. Right. And you find the same thing. Yep. You find the exact same move made by Halevi and the Kuzari. I mean, he lays out, you know, he's, he's got the philosopher, right? I mean, he's got this trialogue going and he's got the philosopher describing all the major, you know, Aristotelian features. And then he's got the rabbi rebutting them. Yes. Right. It's, it's curious, uh, or I would say almost unfortunate, that Halevi lived before Maimonides and therefore <laughs> didn't get to critique Maimonides. That would have been a very interesting... Right. Well, but also, I mean, I, I you know, I, I've always wondered what how Maimonides would, you know, Averroes wrote that the Hafut al Tahafut, what would Maimonides have written in response to Crescas? Yes. Yes, that is uh you know, we don't have we don't have that either. We've you know <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's hundred percent true. Although I assume that Maimonides had his defenders. Um sure. sure. Perhaps you could provide one or two specific examples um of Crescas's uh, ways in which Crescas Mm-hmm. refutes or, or, or attempts to rebut Maimonides. I mean, I know there's a, a strong uh, disagreement on them in the uh, in the arena of free will, for instance. Uh, but there right. are, could, could you perhaps um, outline maybe one or two, just give us examples of points in Maimonides' philosophy that Crescas has you know, very specific objections to? Okay, yeah. Let me start. I mean, Ross Weiss, in her introduction, has a really nice overview. She says that Crescas tried to, quote, to restore to Jewish thought it's a Jewish soul to champion traditional religious belief. And I love that phrase, to restore to Jewish thought its Jewish soul. And so Crescas felt that, again, going back to the elitism, the intellectualism um, espoused by Maimonides had destroyed the inner soul of Judaism. And that was really the focus of his attack. Um, 
He replaces Maimonidean intellect with love. He replaces an Aristotelian deity with a caring God. I mean, the, you know, that's the overview. I mean, that's really what he's he's getting at. But he does so in a number of contexts. There are a number of, of, of important dialogue or debates, I suppose, you know, they're one-sided, obviously, debates between Crescas and Maimonides centering around the nature of Jewish belief versus action. I, I, again, if you're an intellectualist and if you're reading Maimonides, the end of the guide, there are passages in the guide that suggest that performance of the commandments is not nearly as important as intellectual study. Now, Crescas disagrees with that. And Crescas will argue that performance of the commandments, belief is grounded in commandments and not in the intellectual side. And so he, you know, he lays out Maimonides, a, a number of passages, or actually there are commentaries on rabbinic passages. I mean, there are many, many areas in which Maimonides makes that point. And Kreska simply rejects that intellectual contemplation versus um, pra practicing the actual commandments. In fact, it's been argued even that on Maimonides' model, a non-Jew who has achieved knowledge of metaphysics and physics is higher on the intellectual scale than a practicing Jew. Right. And Maimonides finds that unacceptable for obvious reasons. And so you've got this. Uh, yeah, yeah, Crescas finds this unacceptable. Uh, another area of, of um, debate between them is creation of the world. It's not clear what Maimonides thinks about creation of the world. Uh, I have argued that he does not believe in creation ex nihilo. Not everyone agrees with me, but scholars are all over the map. Some people believe that, you know, uh, Maimonides argues for a mosaic theory of creation. Others believe that he's actually in the my in the Aristotelian camp, claiming that the world is eternal; it's never been created. And Crescas is very clearly in the creation ex nihilo camp, and he finds any any suggestion of eternal creation unacceptable. And the reason for that, obviously, is that impinges upon God's omniscience and omnipotence, which raises a third issue, as you mentioned, the whole question of free will. Maimonides struggles very hard to account for how it is that God can be omniscient and omnipotent and yet allow for human freedom. And he, in, in my view, he waffles in the view of others like Chip Mannequin, He's pretty consistent, but, you know, again, there's, it's really hard to read Maimonides on that point. Crescas is unabashedly a determinist and unabashedly taking seriously the idea that if God is omniscient and God knows past, present, and future, then human beings can only do those actions that God already knows that they will do. In which case, he has to struggle with the whole question of reward and punishment, <laughs> which he does in Or Hashem. So they move in very different directions on that point. This is actually something that, that um, puzzles me a little bit about, because this is quite famous, that Chaskai Kreskas lays out a view that many, including yourself, clearly, um, have, have understood as deterministic, because much of Chaskai Kreskas' um, critique of Maimonides seems to come from let, what we might call a traditionalist vantage. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, he's attacking Maimonides because Maimonides goes too far in reinterpreting the plain sense meaning of rabbinic and biblical uh, verses and, and you know and, and let's say traditional ideas that would have been accepted. Maimonides over philosophizes them, over intellectualizes them, and, and abstracts them out of existence. Whereas it seems to me on this particular point of free will, um, Kreskas's traditionalism almost almost goes out the window because it seems very difficult to read the Bible, let's say, or read the rabbinic canon, uh, and not see and not understand human beings as having free will. The whole the whole system seems to be predicated on people having a choice and, and if you choose good, then good things will happen to you. Choose bad, bad things will happen to you. And this it's one of these it's one of these rare occasions where you read Maimonides um quite um Quite, quite radical version of of what what was called libertarian free will. You know the idea that human mm -hmm. beings absolutely do have free will. Right. So, so in a way, they're 
in a way they've crossed over. I mean, Maimonides is advocating a position that one might expect Crescas to take, and Crescas is advocating a much more deterministic position that you might expect Maimonides to adopt, right? But 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 Crescas is being Crescas is pushing divine omniscience much harder than Maimonides. When Maimonides talks about divine omniscience, he it's not clear exactly how far he's going to allow for divine omniscience. And and this and this is actually I want to bring in yet a third figure because no one ever talks about my man Ralba Gersonides, <laughs> but. I mean, Rabag is wonderful. 1288, Avignon. He's working in the papal court in Avignon. He lived a very short life. He actually was at the papal court at the same time that William of Ockham, Christian philosopher, was at the papal court. Really interesting. And I've had all sorts of conversations with people over this point. I mean, obviously, you know, Rabag is working in Hebrew. Ockham is working in Latin, but they both, they both write a treatise in which God knows past and present, but not future. They both, and they are lone, solitary voices in this world of, of, of divine omniscience talk. And I'm convinced that they were talking at the court in Provençal, which would have been the lingua franca of, of the day. And this was no accident that both Occam and Gersonides within two years of one another are publishing descriptions. So according to Gersonides, who also takes issue with Maimonides on this point, he says, God knows all that can be known, but the future is indeterminate. There is nothing for God to know in the future. It does not have a truth value until it happens. And so it's not a deficiency in God's knowledge not to have knowledge of the future, hence humans have free will. It, it, interesting. I, this is... So it's a, it's a wonderful, it, 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 it dovetails very nicely with contemporary discussions of multiverse and open universes in a way that Crescas, Maimonides, all the other medievalists miss. But Occam and Gersonides both have this view of God's omniscience, which I have found intriguing. It, it is absolutely intriguing. It's also intriguing that Maimonides doesn't take this position. Right. I mean, he could have. He could have. He could have, right. He could have. Now, what, what Gersonides has going for him is that he knows Aristotle's chapter nine of On Interpretation, where Aristotle talks about whether or not the future has a truth value and claims that the future is indeterminate. So Gersonides has access to that. Maimonides doesn't. And I've always that, wondered. And I've always wondered. Fascinating. Yes, yes. I mean, these are the little pieces of medieval philosophy that are just so intriguing. Keep us awake at night. That is, well, so, well, you've exactly. got, so you've got Maimonides, you've got Gersonides, and you've got Crescas all talking about divine omniscience and human freedom and coming up with radically different uh, positions on it. And of the three, incidentally, I mean, if you move forward, eventually you'll do Spinoza. Spinoza is so influenced by Crescas. He takes Crescas's determinism and runs with it in the right. ethics. Uh, we, we do hope soon to have a whole episode on Spinoza. And that, that, yeah, that's absolutely going to be one of the questions I'm going to pose. But it seems to me that that's a fascinating tidbit of intellectual history right there, that there was a chapter in Aristotle that Crescas, sorry, that um, Gersonides had and Maimonides didn't. And that may account for the difference in opinion on that very specific point, that whether or not the future has a truth value and therefore whether or not God can know it. Um, and mm -hmm. had Maimonides, because you're right, Maimonides' whole position on free will does seem a little bit puzzling because he he absolutely holds that, yes, human beings have free will, and he absolutely holds that, yes, God knows everything that will happen. Uh, and, of course, these two things do not sit very well uh, with each other. And, and Maimonides does not, at least in the Mishnah Torah, but also in the guide, doesn't do a fantastic job of bringing the two together. No, he does a terrible yeah. job. <laughs> No, but Crescas is more philosophically consistent on this point, but then he doesn't want to, he, he's uncomfortable living with the implications when he turns to issues of reward and punishment. Um, but the other point, I, I do want to come back to this. Uh, we, we talked about Athens and Jerusalem, science and, and Judaism, reason and faith, however you want to characterize that, you know, overworked uh, trope. 
I think it's a point of contention with Crescas, uh, rejecting Maimonides' attempt to reconcile natural philosophy and Judaism. And just to give an example, and in the introduction to the guide, he he gives two examples: Maasem Kavav and Maasem Breshit, the incident of the chariot, the, the the famous example of Ezekiel, you know, heading to heavens with the chariot and the whole story of creation. And he warns his student, for whom he's writing this book, he warns his student saying, look, those are the two secrets of tradition. And so we need to be very careful talking about them and not even teach them to one person or, you know, more than one person. And Crescas takes issue with that uh, alignment of Maase Merkava and Maase Breshut having anything to do with natural philosophy. So again, it's an attempt to disconnect science and Judaism. The two are two separate spheres and let's not connect them. Now, what's ironic about that, and um, I, I, I and others have written about this, by rejecting the Aristotelian corpus, he's also writing during a period when the Christian church is coming down on Aristotle. And so within Christendom, we have the condemnations of 1277, where the church is forbidding the teaching of Aristotle. And those condemnations continue into the 14th century. And so you've got Crescas riding that anti-Aristotelian wave, which gives rise to a whole new way of thinking about physics and science. And so, for example, Ross Weiss, gives the example um, that Crescas allows for alternative thinking in physics, the existence of a vacuum, which was denied by Aristotle. And all of a sudden we can talk about aspects in physics that we couldn't talk about in an Aristotelian world order. And so he he's riding that anti-Aristotelian wave in the Christian world. And then by the end of the 14th, beginning of the 15th century, we see a whole new development in history of science. And I see Crescas really as part of that. So, so let me ask you, so that, this is actually a very interesting question. Is he primarily against Maimonides and using the critique of Aristotle in order to bash Maimonides for, for, because of his, you know, the, the quote unquote unacceptable view of, of, of Judaism? Or is he, or the other way around, does he object to Aristotelianism or, or the Aristotelian view of religion per se and use critique of Maimonides as a way to critique Aristotelianism as a whole. Who, who's, who's Crescas really aiming for? Can I say both? Oh yeah, sure. I, I mean, no, I, I think it's both because I think he's conflated the two. I'm, I mean, I think for him, Maimonides is the, Arist- the Aristotelian par excellence. My, Maimonides represents what goes wrong when we take Aristotelianism too seriously when we push Aristotelianism to its logical conclusions. And so he's really after both of them. I, I, I was going to um, move a little bit towards um, to, towards Gersonides, as you mentioned before, because Gersonides appears, and again, this is the, the general view of him, and correct me if I'm wrong, appears to attack Maimonides from the other side, from the more Aristotelian, a more rationalist uh, a perspective. In other words, it seems that for Gersonides, Maimonides didn't quite go far enough. Is this right? Is this an accurate characterization? Have a, or... um, in, in some in some contexts, yes. I, he felt I mean, he's got a wonderful introduction to his work, um, Wars of the Lord Milchamot Hashem. In fact, it, it, it was so reviled in later centuries that it was uh, nicknamed Milchamot Neged Hashem, Wars right. Against the Lord. <laughs> but in Milchamot Hashem, he he really criticizes Maimonides for uh, for not going far enough, uh, especially in areas of of. Of religious language. I mean, he attacks Maimonides' theory of negative predication, and he says, look, we need to replace the whole discussion of predication with what he calls univocal predication. And so he accuses Maimonides of being too obtuse and not willing to follow his own um, positions to their logical conclusion. My, I, I find Gersonides to be the most logically acute and sophisticated of all the medieval Jewish philosophers. Maybe that's why I love him so much. Um, in the area, for example, of creation, he has no problem adopting 
a position of uh, eternal creation. He says, Maimonides, you had all the pieces there, you just didn't put them together. <laughs> or, or did he? See, this is actually part of the whole problem here, which is that in order to critique Maimonides, as many have, and including Crescas and, and Gersonides, you have to come up with a picture of Maimonides. Right, you have to take, right, you have to have the correct interpretation, but Maimonides is wily enough to have covered his tracks in the introduction to the guide by saying, look, I'm being contradictory intentionally. I place contradictions in the guide so that you won't really know what I'm thinking. Well, I gave a lecture once entitled, Will the Real Maimonides Please Stand Up? Um, we don't know. Gersonides doesn't really know. Crescas doesn't really know. All they can do is quote a text. And then, of course, there's a counter text. And so the whole enterprise is fraught. No, I think that's right. But Gersonides starts out by saying, I'm not playing those games. I'm telling you the way it is. I'm not going to do contradictions. There's a truth to, of, of the matter. I'm going to provide you with logical arguments. And he provides us with scholastic arguments, you know, a la Christian scholasticism. Um, I'm not going to play that game. So very different model. It, it is. It's curious, meaning we are very familiar with strong critiques of Maimonides, less so with strong critiques of, of a figure like Gersonides. I'm sure there were criticisms of him that didn't become a, a cottage industry. Was it simply because Maimonides was a, a greater rabbinical target? Yes. I, I mean, Gersonides wrote, he, he actually wrote some beautiful biblical commentaries. He wrote a wonderful one on Shira Shirim that he uh, completely reinterprets in the light of Aristotelian intellectualism. It's actually lovely. Um, but he was simply, I think he was overshadowed, overshadowed and ignored. And his work was so technical. It was difficult to penetrate. I mean, chapter five or book five of um, Milchamot Hashem is straight astronomy. Uh, Bernie Goldstein at the University of Pittsburgh is the one who has really spent his entire life reading through and translating. But it's very technical astronomy. And so one has to have the sort of scientific background that most people just didn't have to read Raubach, except for the biblical material. You know, the biblical material was read and commented and, you know, has a life of its own. But Milhamot Hashem just sort of died. Yes. It wasn't revived until the 19th century. It is interesting. You could say that, you know, despite Maimonides' best efforts to write in such a way that might be acceptable to many, um, he was the one who was attacked most vigorously and vociferously, whereas Malbag, who simply wrote as he saw it and did not, at least apparently, didn't seem to try and take the trouble to soften or, or make his opinions more palatable, he, he didn't come under the same kind of abuse. Not at all. Not at all. No. Um, I'd like to move quickly, um, spend a few minutes on another important critic of Maimonides, which is uh, Joseph Albo. Um, Joseph Alba, who, who challenged Maimonides, I think, in, in various ways, it so it seems. Um, and as you say, he was a, a um, disciple of Chastai Kreskas. But um, one interesting way he did so was critiquing Maimonides or, or the specific content of Maimonides' principles of faith, articles of faith. So um, could you speak a little bit to the substance of that critique and what Albo sought to place there instead? Okay, so... Albo is a student of Crescas. We actually don't know much about him, but he did write a work entitled Sefer Ha'ikarim, the, uh, the, um, the Book of Beliefs. And Maimonides had given in his uh, Principles of Faith in the Perak Chelek commentary on the Mishnah Torah, he gave the 13 articles, of what he considered to be the 13 articles of faith um, all of which were required by Jews in order to achieve an afterlife. Now, that in itself becomes problematic because resurrection is included as one of those articles, but then there are many, many passages in his other works that appear to deny resurrection. And so it, it turns out to be very problematic, the 13 articles. But Albo isn't interested in that. Shortly after the 13 Articles of Faith, there were already were disagreements. Are there articles of faith at all? Can we even reduce Judaism to creedal statements? Isn't that already a violation of the, the fideistic component? 
creedalism is a Christian thing. We know that Christians have creeds, but Jews don't have creeds. And so we find philosophers arguing, are there 13? Are there three? Are there one? Are there none? And Albo um, enters the fray. He rejects Maimonidean's, uh, the Maimonidean articles, and he reduces the 13 of them to three. The existence of God, the divine origin of Torah, and the doctrine of reward and punishment. Everything else to him is ancillary. And after Albo, of course, there are other critiques as well. And I would say it continues to this day. Your your teacher, in fact, uh, yeah, Menachem Kellner, wrote a work, The Principles of Faith, Rosh Amana Abravanel takes on Albo, right? And he and he rejects Albo's depiction of the articles of faith. So you've got a continuing, continuing. And, and then you've got even to in the 18th century, Moses Mendelssohn picks up the same issue. Are there articles of faith in his book, Jerusalem? So a continuing topic. Right. Uh, absolutely. But it seems that at least Albo accepts the basic principle there ought to be statements of creedal faith. Yeah, that there must be statements of creedal faith. You know, there must be creedal statements, but the question becomes what are they and how many are they and how important are the others? And, of course, did Maimonides really believe all the articles that he himself enunciated? That's another question. Yes, yes. Uh, Menachem Keller mentioned a couple of times a very good article called Could, Could Maimonides Get Into Rambam's Heaven? I think is the name of the article. <laughs> which is, uh, the title says it all, really. Which is very interesting, but it's it, it's also the reason I, I bring Albon the and the uh, the creedal statements up is because even those who reject Maimonides, I mean Maimonides isn't the first one to propose the idea that there there should be dogma, there should be um, you know these mm -hmm. uh, statements of creed about Sadia Khan and others. Um, but Maimonides most famously sort of uh, you know, propagates this throughout the Jewish world, um, and even those who critique him like Albo and others, often adopt elements of the Maimonides, or they right. take it as read that there should be something like uh, creeds, which is not at all self-evident if you're trying, to, if, if, you're, if you present yourself or if one conceives of themselves as an opponent of Maimonides, nonetheless, Maimonides seems to have pervaded Jewish thought so much. It, it, it's impossible to discuss any of these issues without incorporating some of his material. No, that's right. Hundred um, percent. Fascinating. So, I mean, I want to ask a very general question, which um, might be impossible to answer, or might take you know, you might have to, to to go in a few different directions. Which is, you know, how how wounding or how um, successful do you believe these criticisms to be? In other words, in the century or two after Maimonides, you had people like Hans Kreskas, like uh, Gersonides, like uh, Yosef Albo critiquing Maimonides in various ways. And do you believe that they generally succeeded? In, in undercutting Maimonides' philosophical worldview, could is it would it be possible? Could you imagine Maimonides or, or, or a Maimonidean coming back and refuting those objections? Or after these centuries of anti-Maimonidean philosophy, do we have to throw up our hands and say, "Listen, Maimonides' you know philosophical framework isn't just just isn't sustainable anymore"? I mean, where on that spectrum do you fall? I I wrote a whole book on Maimonides. I wouldn't have written the book if I had thought that he's now obsolete. <laughs> right, okay. I, I feel that they're playing different language games altogether. I feel that many of Maimonides' critics, you know, they haven't accepted the rules of the game that Maimonides has. And so many of their criticisms, many of their attacks just don't really affect him. I mean, I think he, even despite Prescas, despite Ralbag, despite Albo, uh, you know, despite even the mystics, you know, uh, you've got, you know, his passages in Nachmanides and his more mystical, Kabbalistic works. No, I think Maimonides stands strong. And I think it's, it's the monolithic systematic nature of the enterprise that they're unable to rip apart. Interesting. Could you perhaps elaborate a bit on that? Because you said they're playing a different kind of language game. And, and I assume that's a reference to, to Wittgenstein and, uh, and, 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 you know, yeah. and all that. So, well, I'm, so we talked earlier about fideism. Maimonides rejects fideism. And so there's a sense in which Crescas and Maimonides are approaching Judaism from two completely different 
worldviews. Crescas is looking at Judaism from the perspective of a fideist. Maimonides is looking at Judaism from the perspective of a rational Aristotelian and Platonist. I mean, you know, we can't forget that he's also very much imbued and influenced by Plato, but, you know, the Greek philosophical scientific worldview. And there's a sense in which never the two shall meet. And so the critiques that Crescas is leveling, leveling against Maimonides aren't going to work for someone who's rejected at the outset the fideistic worldview of such a critic. You know, I'm just not sure how how Crescas could ultimately undermine. I mean, for you know, he argues for Crescas for example wants to claim that Maimonides' arguments for the proof of exi- of, of God's existence don't work. Right. Well, Maimonides himself said that the proofs were not definitive. Maimonides himself said that the proofs were an Aristotelian attempt to, you know, to show that that there's a a god, but Crescas doesn't undermine Maimonides' attempt there. So I think Maimonides survives all the attacks. It survives the attacks, but it, but it seems because the the assumptions of Maimonides and the assumptions of his critics are just... Are just so different. They're just, yeah, they're so different, right. That's an important answer because if... The answer would be then that unless you share Maimonides' assumptions, it would be very difficult to, to thoroughly undermine his philosophy. And, and, and Gerstonides probably comes closer to that than Crescas because Gersonides shares the Aristotelian scientific worldview with Maimonides, but he moves it in a slightly different direction. Crescas rejects it altogether. And I think, you know, that's the difference. And I see the Gersonides critiques as um, a family dispute. You know, he's still in the family, but He's got problems with where Maimonides is going. For Crescas, he's left the family altogether. And and we haven't even talked really about um, uh, about the the critiques from the medieval Kabbalists. Um, and I mean, we don't even have to get into it so much. But it, it does strike me, funnily enough, that there were quite a few medieval Kabbalists who actually were big fans of Maimonides, and actually, mm-hmm. you know. Um, uh, Avram Abu Lafia, for instance, wrote no less than three uh, commentaries on the Guide for the Perplexed, and 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 various other Kabbalists as well. Right, but there's a you know oh, all right. How am I going to say this? There's a maybe I'm thinking Wittgenstein again. Um, there's a, a there's a piece of Maimonides that one might almost call mystical or Kabbalistic. In fact, there's a there's a book on my shelf. Was Maimonides a Kabbalist? And of course, you know, the answer is no. And he rails against Kabbalism and he rails against magic and he rails against, you know, some of what he's seeing in the 12th century or, you know, 12th, beginning of the 13th century in North Africa. But there is almost a mystical strain when he talks about knowledge of God, for example. Coming to a union with God is very similar to the view that the Kabbalists are are developing and playing with. And so they see in Maimonides a kinship, despite the hyper-rationalism. Now, you know, don't forget, there are, there are aspects of Kabbalah that are quite intellectualist and abstruse, right? right. And so that's not necessarily going to turn them off. But they have a vision of divinity that's shared. And so it's not surprising. And of course, you know, you move then to Spinoza, the fifth book of the ethics, and you've got a, I think, a Kabbalistic slash Maimonidean view of union with God. And so there's this direct, uh, direct thread connecting them. So Yes, on the one hand, we see Kabbalah replacing Maimonides in the 15th, 16th century. Kabbalah, Kabbalah, you know, sort of takes over the world, Jewish philosophy, you know, the rationalist strains. I mean, you've got Sporno and you've got some of the others, the Italians, but um, the high renaissance of Jewish philosophy is at an end. Kabbalah fills the gap, but there are points of commonality between them. Very much so. 
Interesting. Um, okay, I, I want to uh, f- end off by asking a couple of questions about the decline of Jewish philosophy, because uh, medieval Jewish philosophy seems to have a relatively clear start date, with, you know, with Sadia Gona and, and his generation, um, and appears to end, or, or certainly suffers a decline, uh, and, and for a few centuries from 15th or 16th century onwards, um, certainly goes into decline until the Haskalah. A, a couple of questions on that. Firstly, when would you place the end date of medieval Jewish philosophy? What for you is the point of decline or all the last great example of the medieval Jewish philosophical tradition. Can I say 1492? <laughs> I mean, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, that pretty much does it. You've got minor voices, for example, um, in Italy. You've got Jewish philosophers in Italy who are writing, but they're already, they're so Christianized that the Judaic, you know, Pico della uh, Mirandola, for example, the, it is a Jewish philosopher, we can own him, but he's already writing in a different voice altogether. I mean, not, not that he was Jewish, but he he's writing no. in a Jewish vein, right? Yeah. Um, but but for, I mean, so so a couple of things. Firstly, I mean, Abarbanel, the Abarbanel was wrote at least some of his stuff post expulsion. Um, yeah, but he's he's such an odd character. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, he did. He he wrote post expulsion. He was a wanderer. He sort of traveled around and. Yeah, I mean, he's a wonderful, he's a wonderful writer, um, but he's a lone wolf, really, in the world. He's one of the very last voices. Right. So, so this, the Jews of Spain get expelled in 1492. Um, what about that caused the end of, of or, or, or uh, put an end to the tradition of medieval Jewish philosophy? Because, you know, was it simply that the great communities from which the philosophers stemmed, um, broke apart and was flung all over the world? Or was there some quality of, let's say, rationalism, philosophical introspection or whatever it is, that stopped in the face of the great tragedy? Because um, this, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to mention, for example, Gershom Shalom's uh, famous theory that that it was the expulsion of Jews from Spain in 1492 and their subsequent, um, you know, being, being um, expelled to all corners of the world, which allowed for the rise of Kabbalah as a system which provided a much more, shall we say, satisfactory explanation for something like... Right. Well, Kabbalah provides, right. I mean, Kabbalah provides a story. Look at Shabtai Tzvi, right? And, and, you know, the rise of Shabtai Tzvi. There's no philosopher who can fill that gap. There's no philosopher who can who can deal with the expulsion in the way the Kabbalists can, because they've got already a theodicy. They've got, a you know, a a theory of the problem of evil and suffering and God and repentance that that just plugs in the hole. Now, also, I think another consideration is that when Jews are expelled from Spain, they're, they're also expelled from the intellectual environment in which philosophy thrived. And so they're now, I mean, where do they go? They go to Portugal. They go to the New World. Uh, there never was much going on in medieval Europe. I mean, you've got, you know, the rabbis are there, but there's no philosophy to speak of. So, to, you know, and so there, there's a void created, an intellectual void, a, you know, a, a mentorship void that's created. Um, and Kabbalah is really filling that gap. Interesting. Um, and so you, I would say that you seem to be, Agreeing at least to a certain degree with with Gershom Shalom and, and just mm-hmm. p- p- positing the other side of that, meaning that was yes. the expulsion caused the rise of Kabbalah, and therefore, consequently, for the for similar reasons, philosophy and became much less satisfactory. Didn't fill the the much the, less satisfying, the, much less satisfying. You know when you know when you've got the you know the Kabbalistic texts are remarkable. I mean, we're still struggling with this in the contemporary academy. Kabbalah programs are full of graduate students. Medieval <laughs> Jewish philosophy, who studies medieval Jewish philosophy? Nobody. Everyone's going over to Kabbalah because it's so much more emotionally and intellectually satisfying. So there's a sense in which Jewish philosophy is stultifying in comparison to the Kabbalistic texts that are coming out. You know, And they're addressing certain needs of an expelled people that the philosophers aren't. So this is exactly the point that I wanted to, if, if I could maybe slightly disagree with your, your your characterization there, because I'm not sure is necessarily the case that Kabbalah is, let's say, more intellectually satisfying 
well, it's more sad. Okay, it's it's more satisfying. Yes, yes. In other words, it satisfies the needs of people who have undergone, let's say, tremendous trauma, tremendous dislocation. Those who are very attuned to the great uh, catastrophes in the world, and, and and so a system like Kabbalah, which or certainly you know let's say, post-15th, 16th century Kabbalah, Lurian Kabbalah, etc., which centralizes Shever and Tikkun, um, that, mm -hmm. that provides a certain emotional, psychological you know, balm, which can, you know, which can be very beneficial. Exactly. And the philosophers aren't providing that at all. They're talking about creation of the world. They're talking about providence. They're talking about divine omniscience. And what's left out of that is the human being in their suffering, nurturing, you know, emotional need. Right. But of course, if, I, however, for example, if I were to approach my monodian and say, look, the, the masses are, are greatly stimulated by Kabbalah, does this mean that this is a better option? Uh, my monodian, or, or and I'd, I suspect most medieval philosophers would turn around and say, no, there's absolutely no correlation whatsoever between what people find comforting and what is actually a worthwhile intellectual endeavor. Right. Uh, what we philosophers are ultimately concerned with is the truth of the matter, uncovering the, the basic nature of the universe. Right, right. It, it's sad that much of human life doesn't allow for um, time and space and and uh, you know a, a clear head in order to do such a thing. Okay, I think we will have to uh, we have to leave it there. Uh, Professor Rudavsky, thank you so much for coming on the podcast of Jewish Ideas. This has been a wonderful conversation, and we hope to have you back on at some point in the future. Thank you. This was really a lot of fun. Thank you so much for the opportunity. This has been the podcast of Jewish Ideas by Torah in Motion, produced by Alicia Kelman and myself, JJ Kimchi, edited and mixed by Alicia Kelman. You can stay up to date by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. To support more thoughtful Jewish content like this, please visit torahinmotion.org slash donate.